it's always helpful to have a question for the moderator because then I'm not everybody's not watching me with trying to switch the. Uh, well, while you're doing that, I'll ask a question uh, between Jerry and Nick and, and uh, the last speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What what percentage of failures or existing pieces are technical or due to the equipment versus change in market and then? Great question. Oh, um, you're not going to have numbers, but you might have. Well, I think I'm both sides. Well, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, I think the first thing, and if you will, uh, take it from uh, you know, the from uh, my concepts, and it's from my how to fix that problem or what is exactly the problem. It covers the spectrum. So if I show you high higher all those. Good. I would say it's fairly evenly distributed. Um, it says but right I think right. probably the most common thing, I don't know, Nick will probably give me some thoughts. I, I think it's probably more of the uh, not fully aware of what you're getting into. The the problems are really costly. It's probably even producing those problems. And that's probably the root of it. Everything's kind of reversed on that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. A lot of things that you can touch on as far as not getting away a lot of things, not understanding all the steps out. So what's going on? Well, it's not showing up on the screen. Do you, uh, when you put in a project, do you put a guarantee on it in operation? How do you handle that? And that's a pretty wide point of view. You're installing it, you're driving it. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me okay? I probably should use them. Can you hear me? Okay, so I won't use the microphone. Um, it's kind of interesting following the last two speakers because I am a former operator of a digester. Um, I'm also a vendor now when we get into, you know, how universities are now into the patent business. Well, we've got a patent on this uh, advancements. Um, so we, we were working with anaerobic sequencing batch reactors. And if you're around in the mid 90s or so, you might have heard a lot about these. Everybody was excited. And uh, Dick Day at Iowa State University was the main proponent. I guess he's the one who you could say invented the idea. Uh, but uh, they're not around anymore. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'm not going to tell you some of the things that we're doing at OSU because we're one of those crazy folks that can't give up on a good idea. So we're, we're still trying to make this thing work. Uh, recently, I uh, reviewed a paper, uh, and I can't remember what it's called, but they had came up with something like sequence batch reactor. So it's actually a high solids reactor, and I say they're recycling the leachate out of the, the column. Uh, an anaerobic sequencing batch reactor is a liquid system. It's a low, you work with our point, if I'm going to be the vendor, my hammer is low solids high energy liquids. Um, but if y'all were at the sugar plant the other day, their wastewater is a perfect example. Lots of sugar, not much solids. This is the kind of system that we're going to use. Um, a hydrolysis reactor or food waste ahead of one of these would work very well. 
How we got involved with swamp was flush swine manure, less than 1% solids. Um, how an anaerobic sequencing bacter, batch reactor works is first you're going to fill it, and then you're going to react it for a period of time. Then you're going to settle the solids, and then you're going to decant the liquid off the top. So the idea is we're going to keep our viable biomass in the settled solids. Um, one of the advantages it has over, say, your upflow reactors is you don't have to worry about your solids spilling over the top. If you've got a slug of solids come through your system, it's not going to blow your biomass out. We do have problems with getting it to settle up. Right? No, so. Um, so this is uh, uh, for primarily for low liquid. You can use on a higher solids material, but you're going you're to lose a lot of the advantage. Um, we got involved in swine waste, Pius Degua, during his sojourn in Oklahoma, did some of the preliminary lab work on this. One of the advantages of an ASBR is you can have a fairly low hydraulic retention time. Uh, Pius was working at the level of four to five day hydraulic retention time. And if you settle your solids well, you can have, you can basically select any solids retention time you want. And we found that we need to really get full advantage of the system, get above 60 days. And I'm going to show you that's not hard at all. So we were in the business of running one of these things. Uh, we operated from 2004 to about 2010. We would be running it today, as I was talking to Carlton last night, it was mostly internal university politics while we're not running it. But we could have kept on beating on this thing and getting it to run. Um, we were one of two that I know of swine ASBRs in the United States. The other one was put in by Iowa State University at a town called Nevada, about 10 miles east of Ames. Neither one of them are running today. And the reason, there's two reasons these things don't run anymore, besides in conflict. Uh, the, the first one is a construction problem. The, you're taking the water level down on the digester, creating not an, actually a vacuum, and then you're adding more water back. It's basically a piston that's detaching the roof off these things. You see, we had a, uh, a, a flexible membrane cover, and basically we separated that from the top. We had a real cheap detachment system, um, but the one they had in Iowa was a rigid cover, and they literally ripped it off off the other. Another uh, little more subtle problem with it is in order to get your food to micro ratio low enough, you really have to retain a lot of solids in the same. Uh, once you get about 1% total solids, they don't like to settle like we like them to. So what we had, it's another design failure, by the way. What we had is we had a number of stand pipes. If we wanted to take it up at the top and have like a 20-day HRT, we would remove liquid from the top. If we wanted as low as a 5-day HRT, we'd use the lower stand pipe. Okay? Things are working fine, but when you get to the point where the uh, solids are so high, if I'm taking from this standpoint pipe, settle down to that point, it's fine. But if I need to take from this standpipe, it's got another hour to go before the solids fund is that. You're just not going to be able to retain solids. All right, so we, uh, forging on ahead, we have a patent pending on some of the improvements we made to try to solve these, basically these two problems. The first one is easy. Every single, not every single, a lot of municipal digesters in this country have a floating cover. You detach it to begin with. And we're letting the uh, the, the cover is going to go up and down. If you lower the water level, the cover goes down with it. If you increase the water level, the cover goes up. The pressure inside doesn't change. The second thing we've done is we've actually made the withdrawal to the cover. So as the, the solids are settling, we can actually suck water out, a liquid out, and follow that flood as it goes down. And uh, we've been toying with this. Uh, one of the things with uh, with ASPRs, 
how long do you relax, react, how long do you settle, how long do you decant. We're basically selling and decant at the same time. So we can have hour, two hour, let this thing sell. The other thing that uh, we stumbled upon is the, one of the problems we had with the full scale reactor was that we were taking, we were recirculating the solids with the jet mixer. We're taking off the bottom, taking all that good solid, crushing it in a pump, and putting it back in the digester. And a microbiologist on our team came up with the idea, why don't you take, just mix just enough to bring the solids up, and then suck the clear liquid off the top and recirculate that. Of course, the engineer said, no, no, we can't do that. You know, we got to have a complete mixing. But we found out we did this, what we call partial mixing, and it's turned out to work really well. Okay. So we're, this is the, the, this is the case of the vol suspended solids while we're mixing. So we're getting a solids front up, and this is a, about this deep of a, a model digester, 36 centimeters. We are actually at this solids level, we were bringing up about halfway up the digester. And then we're removing liquid from the top. And then when it settles, we have what looks like a normal settle. Uh, as it's settled down, we have a gradation about 24 centimeters deep. Uh, so we're removing liquid all at the same quality pretty much as after it settles. In less than 200 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids, of all the suspended solids. This is what we were doing in the full-scale reactor. We were doing a complete mix. We thought that's what we needed to do to get good digestion. And we were taking the liquid out the bottom. Uh, we were crushing a lot of solids. So you see that our decant was coming up around here. It was a lot higher than solid concentration. Which would basically destroy all our aggregates. Okay, we've done some... Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes is the uh, some of the work we've done on that partial mixing system. We have a digest, we have a uh, a room. We have six reactors, all 30 liter reactors. Um, one of the things that I've always come across, I've been working with a and anaerobic digestion for at least 30 years, is that nobody replicates their work. They got one reactor, maybe two. They change the conditions, you know. Everybody knows that nature is pretty variable. You need more replication to, uh, to handle the variability. So we have six reactors. Uh, what we were doing, I won't give the date, that would give away how long it takes you to write the paper. But we were, during the summer, we were running, actually we had, there's six reactors. And the first thing we did, we ran reactor number five was fully mixed. Reactor number six was doing the partial mix. After we did that, we were we ran all five, we're doing the full mix, and then we switched, and then about four months later, we came back and we're doing measurements on the partial mix. Uh, we were feeding, that's an extremely low organic loading rate, but we're, we're bumping it up as we go along. Um, we're using uh, swine manure from our swine farm. Or, uh, this is a little bit, the swine manure from the farm comes out at about around 1% uh, total solids. We're processing solids, taking the hair and some of the big soft pipes, we can put it through the smaller pipes. And then we're diluting it up. And then to bring the COD back up, we're using glycerol to, to increase our COD so we can get a fairly decent loading rate. Uh, the first uh, two cycles per day, every 12 hours, we feed. And then we're running at a 15-day HRT, which is about one-third of the way that Daniel said we should be trying to uh, get. This is our effluent quality of comparing the average of five reactors in the full mix and five reactors in the partial mix. Um, since we have five reactors, we can do statistics on it. This uh, The error bars are standard error at 95% level. You can see that uh, one thing is that we have a much more consistent effluent uh, from all five of our different reactors, very, very uh, small error. The other thing is we have considerably less volatile solids, significantly less volatile solids 
and it's mostly coming from the suspended solid fraction. Okay, so we're we're retaining the suspended solids in the reactor, um, and then you see the volatile dissolved solids are about the same. In this situation, we actually were getting lower COD. We didn't have enough samples of the the full mix to do the statistics on it. Next thing we did, we doubled the loading rate, half the hydraulic retention time. We basically were feeding two liters a day in the first experiment, four liters a day in the second experiment. Uh, now we have all six of our reactors going at the twice the loading rate, two cycles a day, still using the glycerol and the swine manure. This is our effluent quality. We doubled the loading rate, basically didn't change. You're still getting enough solids retention. Uh, you can see that even though we doubled the loading rate, we're removing twice as much liquid, yet our concentration didn't change. Um, and here we we were seeing, for some strange reason, a lower COD in our effluent. So we were getting better digestion the second time around. Right, as we increase the loading rate, we're actually getting better digestion. Uh, this is showing some of the performance. Uh, our SRT, we didn't ever purposely waste solids. The only solids wasting was from taking samples. So basically, we could have, you could say, almost an infinite SRT, 705 days. Uh, one of the things, and, and when you look at the uh, biogas yields, you're going to be saying something's really wrong with this. Those are just way too high. There's no way you can that. One of the things is we were accumulating solids through the entire experiment. So if you're going to look at gas yield, it would be hard to compare one of the reactors that the second time had twice as many accumulated solids. Uh, pH, there was very little effect of pH. Our volatile fatty acids were uh, a lot higher. I mean, they were four times higher. However, it's still low below where you can start worrying about it. In fact, we had low alkalinity too, and if you did the VFA to alkalinity ratio, we're about halfway where we're starting to worry about it. And using most little multiple liter, um, around 0.6 is when you're I think you may have some some inhibition problems. As you can see, this is the volatile the volumetric efficiency, in other words, the gas per volume of reactor. We are more than three times as much probably from the accumulating solids. We're about halfway where we want to be. Um, if the problem is grad students have to graduate, so we're going to kick it up another notch, and then the professor was going to run it himself, and I ended up killing him. But uh, if we kick this up another notch, we would be about where we'd like to be. And we're hoping to have a uh, produce at least our volume in biogas. We'd like to have our volume in methane. Our biogas yield. I wouldn't get too hung up on the absolute numbers uh, because we had the we had this incredible retention of solids. Also, I'm kind of wondering about my gas meters. Uh, but the main thing to see is that there was no uh, there's no significant dis difference in the biogas yield when you put all of the, the five reactors together. Do statistics. There's no difference in the biogas yield, and there is no difference in the removal efficiency. Um, we can get removal efficiencies at this loading rate, COD as high as 91. When we're doing it in the full scale, we weren't there. Okay. When Pius was doing it on the last scale, we were at 95 or so. Uh, I think we could replicate this on the full scale and, and get that those kind of efficiencies. Uh, what we're doing now. Is we're going back and working on, you, if you notice those covers, uh, excuse me, the reactors had rigid covers. Now we're going back with our floating covers. This is a phenomenon that doesn't scale very well, uh, I might add. So we, we've got this, this, oh, that's mine. That's my dog. Uh, we have this funky looking thing that's replicating our uh, floating cover, and this would be the mixing tube, and that's our withdrawal. Uh, so we're testing the floating cover right now. We're working on the mixing and decanting. One of the questions is, how big can these be with a, uh, a jet mix reactor? Um, that's one question. The, the main what, what I want to answer 
If somebody wants to put one of these in, I want to know what do I have to do to get it this height. So we're looking at some of the parameters to uh, to predict the your solid cloud to get to the actual height based on solid concentration. Uh, with that, I think I do have a little bit of time. That's my dog George. He's all ears. So how do you predict the uh, solid front line? Is it going to be how different than what you uh, How do I predict the settling? Yeah. That's actually pretty predictable. Uh, we basically did a number of settling curves with a, a different solids concentration as we were building up the solids and diameter. So we, that's not a problem. Um, as long as we're about around 1% to 1.2% solids, uh, I think the number's off the top of my head, but about two centimeters per minute, we can make that and no problem. Uh, so we can get the solid concentration up to a, a pretty high number for at least this, this type of place. The harder part is predicting how are we going to raise the solid up and not have it get into our system. And we were doing that by trial and error. You know, you crank the pumps up, we start getting some solids and crank it down. We'd like to be able to do that uh, given phases.